in this study, I will be revisiting the book of Revelation. But before I do that, we need to understand the atonement process. Yom Kippur is the only day of the year that the high priest was allowed to go behind the veil into the most holy place, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And there was a very specific set of requirements that had to be met to ensure that he didn't die and that Yahuwah accepted his offerings. So let's walk through those requirements. In Leviticus 16, the first thing we see is that Aaron, who was the high priest, was required to come into the holy place with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And for this particular ceremony, he was required to have on four linen items, a linen coat, linen breeches, a linen girdle, and a linen miter on his head. And before he put them on, he was to bathe himself in water. Then he was to take from the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. He was then to take the bull and offer it as a sin offering for himself and for his house to make atonement for them. And once this was done, he was to take the two goats and present them before Yahuwah at the door of the tabernacle and cast lots to see which goat would be for Yahuwah and which would be the scapegoat. And the goat on which Yahuwah's lot fell was to be offered as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be a scapegoat would be presented before Yahuwah alive to make atonement with and sent into the wilderness as the scapegoat. So we have a total of five animals involved in this ceremony. There is a bull, which is the sin offering for Aaron and his house, two goats provided by the children of Israel, one to be a sin offering and the other to be a scapegoat. And two rams, one provided by Aaron and one provided by the children of Israel, which are both to be burnt offerings. Now, to get a clearer understanding of the meaning of these sacrifices, let's go back to the sin offerings in chapter four. Verse one says, if a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of Yahuwah, which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto Yahuwah for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Yahuwah, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, and kill the bullock before Yahuwah. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before Yahuwah, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before Yahuwah, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. 11. And the skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung, even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place, where the ashes are poured out, and burn him on the wood with fire, where the ashes are poured out, shall he be burnt. So again, we see that the young bullock relates to the sin offering specifically for the priest that is anointed, which will be the high priest, and his blood is sprinkled on the veil of the Holy of Holies and also placed on the horns of the altar and the bull is taken and burned outside of the camp. So that's the sin offering for the high priest and his household. Next in verse 13, it says, if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of Yahuwah, which should not be done and are guilty when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. 
And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before Yahuwah, and the bullock shall be killed before Yahuwah. So now we see a young bull is also the sin offering when the entire congregation of Israel sins. Verse 22, when a ruler have sinned and done somewhat through ignorance, against any of the commandments of Yahuwah his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin wherein he hath sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a male without blemish, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before Yahuwah. It is a sin offering. So now we have a clearer picture. A goat for a sin offering represents a ruler of Israel. And a bull for a sin offering represents the high priest. And the reason why the bull is the sin offering when the entire congregation of Israel sins is because the responsibility for their sin is being laid on the high priest. Numbers 18 verse 1 says, And Yahuwah said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. So it is the primary responsibility of the high priest and his lineage to know and teach God's law to Israel to prevent them from sinning. So when the entire congregation of Israel sins, the high priest and his sons are being held accountable for their sin. Now, another thing that we see here is that Aaron is to cast lots for the two goats. The one that Yahuwah's lot falls on becomes the sin offering, and the other lot becomes the scapegoat and gets to go free. So to get a deeper understanding of this, let's look at Exodus 28. Verse 15 says, And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it. So this breastplate is a part of the attire of the high priest. Skip to verse 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the urim and the tumim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before Yahuwah. Now this word urim is the plural of the word or and or means flame or fire and the word to mean says probably the same as tom which means completeness or integrity from tamam meaning to be complete or finished so the to mean represents being perfected so which goat gets which light well we already saw in leviticus 4 that the sin offering is going to be burned. So the young bull is a sin offering and Yahuwah's lot is also a sin offering, meaning that Yahuwah's lot is the Urim, which goes into the fire. And the scapegoat is the Tumim, which is sent into the wilderness to be perfected. So that covers the bull and the goats. But we also have two rams that are to be presented as a burnt offering. So let's look at this word burnt. The word is ola, which means a scent. So the two rams are a scent offerings. And to understand who these rams represent, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 34. Verse 1, And the word of Yahuwah came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim unto the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. Now skip down to verse 17. And as for you, O my flock, thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he goats. So the cattle would be the bulls. And the rest of the flock are the rams and the he goats. We've already seen that the he goats represent leaders of Israel. And now we see that the rams also represent leaders of Israel. So what's the difference between them? Verse 11 says, For thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep 
and seek them out as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. So now we see who is who because Yahuwah is going to search out not his kids, but his sheep. And rams are mature sheep, which means that the rams represent the righteous leaders of Israel, while the goats represent the unrighteous leaders of Israel. So what we see happening on Yom Kippur is that the entire congregation of Israel is being judged. God is holding everyone responsible for their sin while also covering his mouth and postponing the judgment until his cup of wrath is full. And on that day, the righteous leaders will ascend to God and he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the unrepentant sons and pour out his wrath on them. And the scapegoat is being sent into the wilderness to be perfected. Next, Aaron takes sweet incense and puts them on coals of fire taken from the altar and brings it behind the veil forming a cloud of incense over the mercy seat. He then takes the blood of the bull and sprinkles it seven times on the mercy seat. And he does the same with the Urim goat. Then he takes the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat and puts it upon the horns of the altar. So basically he's just going through the sin offering process. Now, after this is finished, he lays his hands on the head of the scapegoat and confesses all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions on the head of this scapegoat and sends him away by the hand of another man into the wilderness. And this goat bears their iniquities into the wilderness. So what we see is that the children of Israel are being kicked out of the land into the wilderness of the Gentiles bearing their iniquities. However, they will be perfected in the wilderness. Now, after all this is over, Aaron is to take off the linen garments, leave them in the holy place, wash again, put on his regular priestly garments, and offer the two rams to make atonement for himself and for the people. So now that we understand what Yom Kippur was foretelling, let's go see its fulfillment. In Revelation 19, we see the beast and false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. These are the sea beasts and land beasts of Revelation 13. And in my study of Revelation 13, I identify the sea beasts with Marduk or Baal, the calf of the sun. But what about the land beasts? Well, what has two horns like a lamb, but is not a lamb, a goat? And Leviticus 17 verse 7 says that Israel sacrificed to devils. But in the Hebrew, we see that this word sair is translated as goats in Leviticus 4 for the sin offering. So this tells us that goat idols were also objects of Israel's idolatry. And we see the two united yet again under Jeroboam in 2 Chronicles 11 verse 15. So the beast and the false prophet are the bull and goat sin offerings of the day of atonement. The sea beast is the Pharisees, Sadducees, and leaders of Israel who the entire congregation as a whole followed. And the land beast is the zealots. So who is the scapegoat? These are the people who escaped to the Romans on eagle's wings, bearing the iniquity and image of their idols. So the entire congregation of Israel was judged when the day of atonement was fulfilled in 70 AD. And now we are left with the dragon, who is the power behind the beast and false prophet. To identify him, I want to retrace the 666 as the number of a man. The man is still the king of Babylon, but we know Babylon is Israel and Israel's most renowned king is Solomon, who is also associated with 666. So let's count Solomon's 666 talents of gold. In 1 Kings 10, we are told that the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600, three score and six talents of gold. So let's count this gold. In verse 10, we see that 120 talents came from the queen of Sheba. And if we go to chapter 9, we have another six score or 120 talents that come from Hiram. So that's 240 talents. 
Finally, in verse 27, Hiram sends his navy to Ophir and they come back with 420 talents. So altogether, we have a total of 660 talents from 1 Kings. So let's go to the parallel account in 2 Chronicles 9. Verse 13 again confirms that the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. So counting the gold again, we have 120 talents from the Queen of Sheba. And in 2 Chronicles 8, Hiram's servant ships come back from Ophir with 450 talents, bringing us to 570 talents. Now in this account, there is no record of the other 120 talents that Hiram gave to Solomon before. But in order to get remotely close to 660 talents, we have to account for that. And in doing so, we come up with 690 talents. So we have either 660 or 690, but not 666. To reconcile it, we have to chalk the error up to the pen of the scribes. We can see, however, that most of Solomon's goal comes from Hiram, king of Tyre. So let's dig deeper into him. The name Hiram or Kiram is the shortened version of Akiram, meaning my brother is lofty or exalted. And in 1 Kings 9, before giving Solomon the 120 talents of gold, he refers to Solomon as his brother. Now this Hiram, king of Tyre, is also linked to another Hiram, who we see in 1 Kings 7, he sent to Solomon to help him build a temple. And this second Hiram was the son of a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, but his father was a man of Tyre. But if we go to 2 Chronicles 2, verse 13 says, And now I have sent a cunning man and do with understanding of Hiram, my father's, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre. So on one hand, Hiram is the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan. So his mother is a Danite. But on the other hand, he is a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali. So it could be that her mother was a Danite, but her father was from the tribe of Naphtali. Now, Dan is the serpent tribe whose father is the devil. So let's look at this word Tyre and see if there is anything here. We see that it means hard pebble or flint and that it is the name of a city, but it also means adversary or foe, which is the same thing that Satan means. So we're getting warm. But this is where Solomon's wisdom ends. It falls short for us as it did for him. Now, I happen to know that God considers Daniel to be wise. He called him wise in Ezekiel 28. So let's follow God's wisdom there. Verse 1 says, The word of Yahuwah came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. So we see here that the king of Tyre is wiser than Daniel, or at least thinks that he's wiser than Daniel. And he used his wisdom to get riches, which made him proud. So as a result of this, God pronounces a judgment on him. Now, the interesting part of this judgment is in verse 10. It says, thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. Now, the question here is, why would it be pronounced on the prince of Tyre, a foreigner to Israel, that he will die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers? That seems like a judgment that would come on an Israelite. So let's identify this prince of Tyre. Moreover, the word of Yahuwah came unto me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, 
every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So the first thing we notice here is that in verse 12, he is the king of Tyrus with the word being Malek. But in verse two, he was the prince of Tyrus with the word being Nagid, meaning leader, ruler, or prince. So that's the first thing. But let's address verse 14. It says, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, according to the Strong's Concordance, it says that the cherub is probably an order of angels. And in Ezekiel chapter one, Ezekiel has a vision while he is by the river of Kabar. Ezekiel sees a likeness of four living creatures come out of the midst of a whirlwind. And he tells us that they had the likeness of four faces, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Now in Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel sees these four creatures again, and he identifies them as cherubim. And he confirms that they have four faces, the face of a cherub, the face of a man, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. Now in verse 20, Ezekiel confirms that these are the same creatures that he saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kabar. So based on the way he describes the faces, the face of a cherub is the face of an ox. So a cherub is a bovine creature, ox, bull, calf, cow. And this ox first is anointed and he also covers. So let's look at this word covers. The word is sakak, meaning to overshadow, screen, or cover. And this word is used in Exodus 25 verse 20, where the wings of the cherubim cover the mercy seat. And also in Exodus 40 verse 3, where it says, and you shall put in it the ark of the testimony and partition off or cover the ark with the veil. Again, in Exodus 40, verse 21, it says, And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as Yahuwah had commanded Moses. So looking at verse 14 again, this is saying that the king of Tyrus is the anointed bovine creature that goes behind the veil. So let's deal with verse 13. It says, thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. So where is Eden? Eden is mentioned only 16 times in the scriptures. In Genesis, then as a name in 2 Chronicles. So let's look at Isaiah 51. Verse three says, for Yahuwah shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of Yahuwah. So here, Zion is being compared to Eden. Ezekiel 36, verse 33 says, Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden. 37. Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. As the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men and they shall know that I am Yahuwah. So here... Eden is once again Jerusalem. And finally, let's look at Joel 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of Yahuwah cometh, for it is nigh at hand. 
a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. So that's three times that Jerusalem or Zion is compared to Eden, the garden of God. Then we have a list of precious stones that were his covering. Sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. I'm just going to click on the emerald. We see the first occurrence of this is in Exodus chapter 28. Verse 15 says, And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, and of fine twine linen shalt thou make it. Verse 17, And thou shalt set in it settings of stone, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. The second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a ligure, and a got, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. So all nine of the precious stones that were mentioned in Ezekiel are present within the breastplate of the high priest. Therefore, the king or prince of Tyrus is the high priest of Israel who just like the king of Babylon was in the garden of God, Jerusalem, and knew God's law, but decided to turn away and do his own thing. And this analogy is most fitting as Aaron was the one who instead of chastising Israel when they asked for gods to worship, made them a golden calf and claimed it was Yahuwah, then lied to Moses and said it came out of the fire that way as if by magic, which moves into the next point the name of blasphemy. Even though the worship of the beast is the worship of Baal, this beast still represents both the priesthood and the congregation of Israel. And the high priest wears a turban with a golden plate on the front that says holy to Yahuwah. So the name that is written on the seven heads of the beast is Yahuwah's name. And because of that, it is called the name of blasphemy. The same way it was blasphemy when they assigned his name to the golden calf. So the high priest is now linked to both the dragon and the beast, which we know is a bull, but is portrayed as the spitting image of the dragon. So let's identify this form. The beast that rises from the sea is Leviathan. And on one hand, it pictures wicked Israel as Pharaoh, as in Ezekiel 29 meaning the dragon pursuing the woman as she flees into the wilderness on eagle's wings for 1260 days of nourishment is a picture of the exodus, which is why we see the plagues of the exodus in Revelation as promised in Deuteronomy 28. But on the other hand, the name meaning is literal. Levi and Tan, join dragon or join to the dragon. Well, Dan is the dragon, so who is joined to him? All Israel really, but since the priesthood is being singled out, it must be Levi like we see in Judges 18. Now this beast, which we know is a bull, but also Leviathan, is just a dragon after it has shed its skin. The skin, which is the dragon form, is the seven crown heads who are the seven kings of the seven mountains in Revelation 17. And the renewal is the ten crown horns, who received their authority from the seven kings. Now, mountains are places of worship. And obviously, there were no actual kings in Israel at that time. So this is again referring to the priests as kings. And the kings being spoken of are identified in Josephus Antiquities Book 20. So the first thing we see here is that Josephus says that Herod was appointing priests that were of no eminent families and barely of those that were priests, and that his son followed suit. This makes it quite possible that the priests being selected during the Herodian dynasty were non-Levite. Nevertheless, Josephus tells us who they were. In chapter 9, it says, And now Caesar, upon hearing the death of Festus, sent Albinus into Judea as procurator. 
But the king deprived Joseph of the high priesthood and bestowed the succession to that dignity on the son of Ananus, who was of himself called Ananus. Now the report goes that this eldest Ananus proved a most fortunate man, for he had five sons who had all performed the office of an high priest to God and who had himself enjoyed that dignity a long time formerly, which had never happened to any other of our high priests. So this man Ananus and his five sons had served as high priests, making six of them. And this Ananus is the Annas of John chapter 18, where we are also told that he is the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the same Caiaphas who condemned Yeshua and Stephen. So this leaves very little, if any doubt, that we are looking at the correct seven heads. And those heads are number nine, Ananus, the son of Seth, 11, Eleazar, the son of Ananus. 13, Josephus Caiaphas, the son-in-law to Ananus. 14, Jonathan, the son of Ananus. 15, Theophilus, his brother and son of Ananus. 17, Matthias, the brother of Jonathan and son of Ananus. Possibly 21, Jonathan, who may have served an additional term. And 24, Ananus, the son of Ananus. So Ananus be Ananus, who executed James the Just in 61 and was deposed for it after three months, marks the end of this family's priesthood, which is why we no longer see the dragon after Revelation 12. But Ananus rises again as one of the ten horns of the beast who sets up the Judean provisional government, thus giving the beast its power. The beast itself is a bull up until this point, representing Israel even though it is pictured as Leviathan. But the snake sheds its skin again and reinvents itself, this time as a goat, which is the zealot, the little horn of the beast. From this perspective, the deadly head wound occurs when Ananus is killed in 68 by the Edomites working with the zealots. At that same time, the serving high priest, Joshua ben Gamala, was also killed, meaning the bull should be dead. But lo and behold, the zealots install a puppet high priest named Phanias ben Shemuel and revive it. So the goat and revived bull are one, and the agenda is the same, to rule Israel. Now let's go back to the image of the beast. The zealots minted coins, just as the Judean provisional government did before them. But the JPG revolt coins said, for the freedom of Zion. And they also replaced the Tyrian shekel, used to pay the temple tax. But the zealot coin said for the redemption of Zion. And this speaks to the buying and selling aspect of the mark. If we go to Exodus 13, we see that God claimed all the firstborn males in Israel as compensation for sparing them in Egypt. But then in Numbers 3, he makes a substitution for the Levites and required that all the firstborn be redeemed with money. So they're using these coins to redeem their firstborn is actually worship of the beast. And that's apart from the consideration that in all probability, their worship also included child sacrifice. And although we don't have a historical witness for this, since Josephus had already defected to the Romans, we do have the witness of scripture. And this was unfortunately par for the course for Israel. Finally, we get to the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of his name. In Revelation 13, we saw this as the name of the spirit of the sun, which is Sarah. And the number of the name is calculated using Hebrew and Psalms to 666. Now you probably never heard of this name before, and neither had I. But I have another name that I am 99.9% .9 sure you do know if you are a native English speaker. Let's look at this name in Hebrew. But instead of reading this name in Hebrew from right to left as it should be read, let's transliterate it into English by reading it from left to right. So we see that the letters here are Tav, Resh, Vav, Samek, which gives you a pretty good idea of the name. But if you are like me and believe that Vav actually makes a W or U sound, then you get the name of the beast exactly. And this name has been preserved in three different lingua franca, being English, Greek, and Latin. Add to that the other Romance languages that use derivatives of this word, and a large portion of the earth 
can easily recognize this name. So between this study and Revelation 13, I have now presented you with the 666 five times. Count it once as the number of the beast, count it twice as the number of the name of the beast, and twice as the number of a man, although I could only count it once. In all cases, the result leads you to God's wrath being poured out on the wicked leaders of Israel in 70 AD. Finally, let's look at Revelation 12 through 19 in the stars. First, we see a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. The crown of 12 stars is Leo, and the alignment tells you that the day is Yom Teruah. Next, we have the dragon waiting to devour her child as soon as it is delivered. Then, we see the man-child to rule the nations with the rod of iron. Next up is Michael and the angels fighting the dragon. Then we see the woman flee into the wilderness on the wings of a great eagle. Water is cast out of the dragon's mouth like a flood with the intent of carrying her away with the flood, but the earth helps her and swallows up the flood. Next, we see the beast rise out of the sea, and this beast has seven heads. Those seven heads are identified in Daniel chapter 7. The first head is the head of a lion. The second head is the head of a bear. The next four heads are the heads of a leopard. And the fourth head is the head of the unidentified beast, which we now know to be a bull. And here we can see that this bull is about to be clubbed in the head, which speaks to Malachi 2. And it says, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith Yahuwah of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. So here, Yahuwah is identifying himself to the priests as Yahuwah of hosts, which means Yahuwah of armies. So the allusion here is to Yahuwah, coming with his armies to war against the priests. And that is exactly what we are seeing depicted here. Next, we have the beast rising out of the earth. And after Yahuwah Sabaoth is done with the first beast, he is next in line. From here, we go into the two witnesses. And after that, we see a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now here, we see that this lamb is Leo. And this goes back to the duality I spoke about in Yeshua, angel of Yahuwah. Next, it says that they have no rest day or night that worship the beast. And to see this, we have to go back to Revelation 4. So we see there are four living creatures before the throne of Yahuwah. And in this case, the eagle is Scorpio. And these living creatures are present at the four corners of the earth. And each of them have six wings. So 24 total wings. Now looking at them, you see one body plus six wings, making seven total components. And these four beasts worship God day and night, which is all four seasons, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next, we see the son of man coming in the clouds with the golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And after he casts in his sharp sickle and reaps, we see him treading the winepress without the city. Then we see seven angels, which goes back to the seven stars, the Pleiades, and these seven stars sit in the constellation of Taurus and resemble a sore. Then John is taken to the wilderness where the woman is riding the beast, which here is the dragon. Now it may look like this woman is a serpent charmer, but we know this serpent cannot be charmed. And at the time of John's writing, five of the seven kings were fallen. One was, and the other was not yet come dating it to Jonathan's priesthood before the three-month short space of Ananus in 61. So this is before it turns on her in Revelation chapter 12. She escapes in Revelation 12 only to find herself in league with it again after it has shed its skin and become Leviathan. Finally, we see the cup of God's wrath being poured out on this woman. After the serpent turns on her, eats her flesh, and burns her with fire, before shedding its skin yet again. And after the gig is up, Yeshua comes on the white horse in Revelation 19, and all three layers of skin go into perdition on the Day of Atonement. But the serpent himself is still on the loose. 
but even he will be bound and cast into the abyss in the not too distant future if my understanding of prophecy is correct. So what should we take from all this? If you have elevated yourself to the position of teacher or leader and you are standing at the gate of the kingdom redirecting traffic, meaning intentionally teaching false doctrine to deceive people in order to keep them out of God's kingdom because of some prejudice you have or for whatever other reason, you better think again because God has your number. And if you don't repent, you just might find yourself in the fire alone, bearing the iniquities of those you try to deceive as they look on from inside the kingdom. And if you come to the realization that you have been unintentionally teaching false doctrine, you are not to try and cover your sin. You need to confess it. And not just to God, you need to try to reach everyone who heard it with the truth to make sure that you don't look down on judgment day and find that there is blood on your hands.